Bismillah walhamdulillah. And the Salah, the mercy of Allah, His compassion and forgiveness be on all of His messengers. We do not make any difference between the messengers of Allah. And we beg of Allah to forgive their sins and also the sins of those righteous people. And I pray to Allah to make me, you, our loved ones amongst the righteous people. Amen. My dear sisters and my brothers, Assalamu alaikum. There is only one eternal truth that everyone can say without any doubt, and that is death. Anything else is open to speculations, but death is the only certainty that exists on earth. We will all die at one point or the other. And my recent loss of my child, of my son, of 26 years of age, has been a very hard experience. And that triggered this talk about death. I so much wanted to speak about death for some time now, but it's just too many topics to cover. Which one comes first? And uh, just like this, when my son was taken away, then this was an opportunity. The reason being is that I experienced death firsthand, and I also experienced so many other things, challenges, uh, situations, events. And I want to share with you my personal experience, but also we take this opportunity to speak to you about death. What is that? What happens to us? Why do we have the beliefs that we have? And I want to start my talk about a man that once upon a time lived in some thousands of years ago. This man was on his donkey and on his way to attend to some of his business. And because his journey was a distant one, a far one, he had packed food and water and then set off to do his business. This time his journey took him to a very interesting city. A city he hasn't passed before, he hasn't seen before. The city was empty and deserted and unbeknown to him, as I said. It was just ruins and no sign of life whatsoever. As the man was passing by, he entered into a conversation with himself. And I am going to invite Allah right now, himself, to tell us about the man, the deserted city, and the donkey. Allah says, O kalladhi marra ala qaryatin wa hiya khawiyatun ala urushia. Or like that man who passed by a town, a completely ruined and deserted town. The man entered into a conversation with himself. He thought to himself, how can Allah give this town its life back when it has completely died? To show him what Allah is capable of. Allah, فَأَمَاتَهُ الله عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعْثَهُ Allah deathed him for 100 years, then sent him back to life. Subhanallah. The man died for 100 years. People say we never got anybody that came back from death to tell us about death. Well, this man did. He was dead for 100 years. And then Allah gave him life back again on earth. Then Allah asked this man, قَالَ كَمْ how long did you stay like that? How many years did you stay the way you were dead? The man answered saying, قَالَ لَبِثْتُ يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمًا He answered, a day or part of a day, i.e. a night, half of day or half of a night. The man, when he died for 100 years, did not decay, he did not lose his body, he did not become born, he did, nothing happened to that. But his donkey did. The man was just like you would find somebody asleep. But for 100 years, Allah ensured that no other human would find that man dead. So he was away from people's eyes. This was a lesson to that man. And as I said many times before, Allah before used to manifest himself far more than he does today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries on telling us this. Now, if someone came to you as you woke up in the morning and told you uh, that you have slept, and then they ask you, how many hours did you sleep? And they need you to answer without you looking at 
any external factors that will help you find the time. For example, if I just kept the room absolutely dark, no windows, you cannot see outside, and I will ask you how many hours, how long did you sleep, you will not be able to say. And if I take anything else, if you had somebody trapped in a place where there is no external light, they will lose track of time. They, that's it. it's, it's incredible. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same thing, asked the man how long did he stay, and the man could not answer. So Allah tells him now, and this is where Allah is going to answer his question for him and for us. Allah tells him, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِكَ وَشَرَابِكَ لَمْ يَتَسَنَّهُ and this is the contrast. Look at your food and drink. They have not gone bad. They remained for 100 years. The food of this man and his water, nothing happened to him, them. Nothing, nothing. It's like he just slept for 20 minutes and woke up. And then Allah brings the other contract, the other thing that's going to blow his mind and my mind and your mind. And it should. Allah tells him, وَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ حِمَارِكَ وَلِنَجْعَلَكَ آيَةً للناس. Now, pay attention to your donkey. The man looks to the donkey and it is completely bones, nothing. The donkey is so dead for 100 years. And then Allah tells him, and we are going to make your story both a lesson for mankind and it's something for you. Illustrate what Allah is capable of doing. The man totally lost with this reality. Now Allah adds and he goes, وَانْظُرْ إِلَى الْعِظَامِ And now look to the bones of your donkeys, this so dead donkey. كَيْفَ نُنْشِزُهَا ثُمَّ نَكْسُهَا لحمة. And look at the bones and watch carefully how we are bringing those bones together, how we are going to build them again, how we are going to raise the bones of your so dead donkey, and then we are going to clothe your, those bones with flesh. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the process of creation right in front of this man's eyes. Imagine a donkey that is so dead for a hundred years, one hundred years, and you see the process of the creation of the donkey all from fresh until the donkey was completely remade and the donkey stood right in front of the man as if the man had just slept for 20 minutes. The food remained, the donkey so dead, and the man also was dead. The donkey's body decayed and decomposed. The man's body did not, and the food stayed intact. And then Allah says, فَلَمَّ تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ And when all became clear in front of him, and he saw the whole process of creation, قال, and he said, أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ I very much know now, I am totally certain that Allah is capable of, about on everything that Allah wants to do. You see, Allah didn't mention the name of the man because it's so irrelevant. It has no importance whatsoever. It's more the value of the story, what we get out of the story. But our men of religion didn't settle for that. They didn't respect Allah's privacy. I don't want to tell you who the man is. Just take the lesson. And then what they did, they claimed that this man that Allah has deathed is Uzair. Uh, or Ezra, as it's the name is in the Bible. However, Uzair is not the same man in this story. This is a completely different uh, man altogether. The reason our man of religion opted for Uzair is due to the fact that the children of Israel consider Ezra or Uzair as the son of God. But the truth is, Uzair is considered by the Jews as the son of Allah, not because of this story, but rather for a much more sinister case. Ezra is a Hebrew name that Allah translated for us to Uzair. This man, Ezra, was a religious leader of the Jews. You see, when the Jews returned from the exile to Babylon, Ezra came up as a reformer who then reconstituted the Jewish community on the basis of the Torah. It's like Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab in Saudi Arabia. This man came, or Ibn Taymiyyah, all these people. These were leaders. They started using the, the Bible, and he brought the children of Israel one more time around the Bible. And then he started making the regulations and the laws and everything from the Torah. And by the way, the Torah are the first five books 
of the Old Testament. When you take now the current Bible, you've got the New Testament, you've got the Old Testament. When you go to the Old Testament, there are the five books in there. Anyhow, the work of Ezra helped make Judaism a religion. Prior to Ezra, it was not a religion. It was books and things like that. All right? and, and then the Torah became the central point, enabling the Jews to survive as a community when they were all dispersed all over the world. Since his efforts did much to give the Jewish religion the form that became today what you know about Judaism, four centuries he made an impact, and that is how Ezra has been called the father of Judaism. In other words, the specific form that the Jewish followed that is today comes from the Babylonian exile. That is why in the eyes of his people, the children of Israel, he is regarded as no less important as a second Moses, while others again went further and considered him as a son of God. And this is why Allah says, وَقَالِتِ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْرٌ إِبْنُ اللَّهِ And the Jews said that Ezra or Uzair is the son of Allah because just like Christians, Allah sent Jesus and the Jews of course came up with that idea. So it's a completely different ball game altogether. The two men are different. The man that saw his donkey is not the man that built Judaism. So I pray to Allah this is clear. Now, what is death? If, so, if I was to ask you, what is that? The death, okay? At first it seems like a silly question, right? Who on earth doesn't know what death is? Well, since our religion is wrapped in a layer called Arabic, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the final message to be in Arabic. Therefore, the term mawt must have a meaning more than just somebody lying there with no soul in them. Anyone who has taken a little time to study the Quran will find out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the angel that is responsible for taking the souls of people as medical mote, the angel of death. Therefore, it's understandable that we refer to people who are no longer living as dead people. Yet, at the same time, Allah calls those who sleep at night as also mayit, as someone who is dead. Therefore, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he mentions in the Quran, when someone loses their life, they are dead, okay, they are mayit. And also when someone is sleeping or sleeps at night, he, she is also mayit, is also dead. But Allah gives life back to the sleeping person and he doesn't give it back to the moving person to the next world, i.e. the dead person. That's the difference between between the two. Look at what Allah says in the Quran. Allah, i.e. it is him, it is Allah who takes the souls at the time of their death. And as for the ones that doesn't die in its sleep, i.e. when we are asleep at night, our souls are taken away by Allah. And then, if, for example, two people sleep, one is going to die, the other one is not going to die. So what happens is this. Allah Allah withholds the one from returning to the one he has verdicted to death. And then he sends the other one that he has not verdicted to death until an appointed in time, until their time for death comes around. And then Allah says, Inna fi la yatafakkarun. Of course, what Allah has mentioned in this ayah part of the Quran is a clear mark to a people who use their thinking faculties. They do everything to study the Quran. And this is in Surah az zumar 39, and the ayah is 42. Therefore, according to the Quran, death is a state of absence of the soul away from the body. And that soul is what we refer to as a nafs. That's why Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas, ittaqwa rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. Mankind, 
take precautions from your Lord who created you from a single nafs. And nafs, as I said, is called also soul. Nafs is what Allah created us from, and it is not visible to the human eye, no matter how we study them. Today they say the soul is made of electricity, blah, blah, but that is not true. We are not uh, made of electricity. Maybe our body communicates like electricity, but uh, we the soul that we are is a secret kept to Allah. Maybe it will reveal it in the future, but as for now, it is in the hands of Allah. Then Allah decided to put this nafs into a container. You see, in the early days, there was just the nafs, the, the soul, the spirit out there. But it was there. Allah sees it, but that's that. So Allah, when Allah wanted to do something with it, He decided to create a container. And the human body is nothing else but the container of the nafs. When Allah wanted to box the nafs inside this container, the, the, the human being, the, the body, this task was given to Jibreel alayhi salam, whom I've said is not an angel and the talk is on YouTube. And uh, just like Jibreel was given the power to inject the nafs, the soul into its container, the angel of death was given the power to withdraw that nafs, that soul, from its container for good. And only the angel of death can do that. Yes, he has angels that help him, but it's the function of the angel of death to collect the soul at the time of death. Humans refer to death as death, mort en français, dude in Deutsch, muerte in Spanish, but the result is always the same. So, what does the meaning of mot, el mot in Arabic mean? Well, in Arabic, the term mot or death has few meanings. It means stillness, something is not moving. And it also, for example, you say the wind has died. It's not has died, but it has come down. It has become uh, still. All right? And in Arabic, the Arabs before would use the term mad when they refer to something that had, well, the energy, whatever is making the power of that, whatever it is, has gone away. So when the human body dies, it means Everything that can make that body move has gone away. The soul never dies. Except, as I said, uh, those people that will die in paradise on Herfa, but that is a topic for another day. But you know, when people die, they will die in one of the three ends. And you are free to choose your end. You see, at the time of death... Any humans, whoever they are, they might be, and whatever situation they are, will die according to one of the three situations. Those who go with good news. As Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا As for those who have said, our Lord, or the one on worship, is God, Allah. And Allah here doesn't have to be Allah in Arabic. It could be anything where humans understand that that form there is God. Okay, and then Allah says, and they remain upright on that. They don't do something that will nullify that belief. Allah says, at the time of death, تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخاف ولا تحزنوا. The angels will descend upon them with the angel of death, of course. And before you leave this world, when you are still alive, but in the last breathings, in the last seconds of your life, the angels will tell you, do not fear. And do not grieve. Do not fear about what you are going to face. And do not grieve on those you have left behind. And the angels will announce to you what's coming up and next. They will tell you, وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ And receive the good news of the Jannah, of the paradise, which you were promised before. How did Allah promise that? In the Quran. And then the angels will add another layer of comfort and support to you. And they will tell you, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ The angels will tell us, we are your allies here in this life and also in the hereafter so when the hereafter comes when the hour will resonate and when we stand in front of Allah some of us will have angels comforting them all the way until they enter paradise and that's why you need to make friendship with these angels in this life 
and then the angels will carry on saying walakum fiha ma tashtahi anfusukum and in the jannah you will have everything you so desire for yourselves walakum fiha ma tadda'un and you will have anything you wish to become or what you ask in Jannah is given to you. And why is all that? Nuzulan min ghafurir rahim. The Jannah is a hospitality suite prepared by Allah for those who said our Lord is Allah and they stayed as much as they could on that pathway. So these are the, this is the first group. Now there are those who will live this life with terrible, terrible news. And Allah says about these people, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ يَتَوَفَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And only if you could see at the time of death those people that have disbelieved, that have done wrong, and anybody that has been evil and all that kind of stuff, the angels will come to them in a very angry state. The angels will beat them up. They will beat their faces, whatever is in front of them, and their behinds, the back, and everything. Subhanallah. And the angels, as they beat them up, and this is before death, as they, we don't see that, but the people are suffering. And then the angels will say to them, saying, taste the torture of the blazing fire, i.e. we beating you up here and this is just a premonition this is just a, a telling you w what's coming up is the blazing fire and the reason being is that that is because of what your hands have forwarded the actions you have done and that Allah is not unjust to his slaves it's impossible that Allah would write as they say decree that someone should kill somebody else and then Allah will torture the other one for killing the other one but it doesn't happen like that if someone commits a murder they have committed that murder out of their own choices. Allah is out of it. And then Allah gives us a real example of what he has done. He says, This is just like it happened to the people of Fir'aun and those that were before him. So you have the two extremes here. Announcement of Jannah announcement of punishment and then that is those who will live this life with no news at all they are so uncertain so scared so confused and that is the third group and you don't want to be in this group whatsoever because you don't have a good news that you're going to have a good passage to the hereafter and you don't have an evil news so you are in limbo you don't know what's going to happen to you so when we die, where will the soul go after it leaves our body? Well, when the soul is taken away from its container, the human body, it is then taken to a different world. That world is completely different than the one we live in today. The, the laws that run this world do not apply in the next, wherever the soul goes to. And I'll get to that. Think of it this way. The nafs. Your soul doesn't breathe in the other world. Like I'm talking now the person is dead and the soul has traveled. That soul does not need to breathe and it does not need to eat. It doesn't get cold and it doesn't get warm at all. Because the nafs in this life is what operates us. The nafs is what makes us do things. The nafs is the driver, if you like. And it is the nafs that will be held accountable on judgment day. That's why Allah on judgment day will create a new container for the soul in the hereafter that is different than the ones we are here. We are still humans, but the, that container there or the physique or the body will be different. Allah says in Al Quran, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسْوِسُ بِهِ نَفْسُهُ And we have created the humankind being, you and me and everybody, and are well aware of what their nafs, their soul makes them do. It's not shaitan, it's you. Shaitan whispers only, but whatever triggers your action is you. Never shaitan, never, 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 never. And then Allah says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And we are so closer to them, to the human being, than their jugular vein, i.e. Allah knows the details of everything, and he has explained this elsewhere in Al-Quran. On judgment day, it is the nafs, as I said, that shall dispute evidences that are against it. 
Look what Allah says. He says, يَوْمَ تَأْتِ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ تُجَادِلُ عَنْ نَفْسِهَا On the day of judgment where every nafs, every soul will come pleading for itself. وَتُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And each nafs, each soul will be paid in full for what it had done and none will be wronged because remember it's your nafs, it's your soul, it's what motivates you, the thoughts and everything that make you do things and on judgment day that is who is going to get rewarded and the body is nothing else as I said but a container. So now that we have established that the nafs is what drives our body, let's see what happens happens once we die. When we die, the different parts of us go to complete different directions, i.e. the human body and the nafs, the soul that makes the body functions. Allah speaks about the, the body really simple. And he says, Minha khalaqnakum, from the earth we created you, wa fiha nu'idukum, and we will return you into earth, again, Liberian, وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى And from it, the earth, we will exit you for judgment another time. So that is pretty simple, right? Somewhere else, Allah explicitly says that it is him, ثُمَّ أَمَاتَهُ فَأَقْبَرَ Then it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that causes a human to die because the one who will sign your death is Allah. If Allah doesn't sign or agree to your death, nobody can take it. The angel of death can do all it does, but it always awaits Allah's command. So it is Allah that has amatahu faqbara. It is Allah that caused the human being to die, ordering him to be dead and everything. And then it is Allah who also has ordered that we put him in the grave. How we put him in the grave and all that stuff is left to humans. And I will cover this in a little bit when I speak about my son's burial then Allah says ثم إذا شاء أنشرا then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that is the end of time Allah will resurrect that person that human being again so from this ayah or the clear mark or the clear text that Allah has put here we the believers cannot cremate our deads we cannot burn them we cannot feed them to sharks and etc Allah has commanded us to bury our deads and that is how we are going going to do it and that's why we bury our death and all religious people do the same thing they all bury especially uh, in Islam and in the three branches Judaism Christianity and us the believers that is one Islam that's what we do so now let us go back again to the nafs once the angel of death and his team collect the nafs they will take it straight away and the first thing they will ever do if the nafs is nice if the soul has been a nice person that had done good real things and is in good terms good relationship with Allah the angels will travel with it to heavens and then once they get there the guardians of heavens will open the doors and the good nafs will pass through doors of these doors but for and then Allah doesn't tell us what uh, what will happen but of course the hadith and all that kind of stuff go in some like uh, totally incredible details that do not hold soul that are untrue because if they were true Allah would have mentioned them in the Quran pure and simple but Allah didn't so all we know is the gates of heaven will open and the soul will go through that and that is a sign of Allah is pleased with it pleasure, pleasure from Allah to that nafs because the opposite is very scary Allah says about those who have belied the message of Allah, those who have rejected the Quran, those who have rejected the Bible, those who have rejected the Torah, those who have rejected the, the books that Allah has said and did not obey their messengers, he tells them, Surely those who have rejected our ayah, the text in the book of Allah, and stood arrogant against them. So they belie and they were arrogant against what Allah says. Allah says in the Quran, لا تفتحوا لهم أبواب السماء The gates of heavens shall not be open for them. That's that. So what that means to us is that the good people will have the gates of heaven open to them and the bad people will not have the gates of heavens open to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that everything in is, is in the Quran. All we have to do is really take a little time and study what Allah says to us and everything will become clear.
the warnings about the gates of heaven opening and closing and not letting this one and having mercy on those ones are really clear. Allah has made everything in his God and divine powers to convey the message to us without going beyond what he can do because Allah can make everybody believer but that is not the purpose of this creation there are people however at the time of death when they are certain that they are going to go but these people did not hold a good relationship with Allah they will do something and that something every human being will do it and that is asking Allah to return back to life to do good listen to this حتى إذا جاء أحدهم الموت قال رب ارجعون until when death comes to one of them those people that are not in good terms with Allah they say my Lord Ya Rabbi God let me go back and who do they say that to? to the angels who came with the threats from Allah they will say please let me go back I don't want to die now and then why they will plead to the, uh, to the angels and try to put their case forward maybe I could do much better good in what I have left from my life in that life there and then Allah sends because the angels are peaceful they are merciful creatures and for that they will probably feel sorry for this person at that point Allah intervenes and he says Kalla! No, no way, no way, never. Innaha kalimatun huwa qailuha. It is only a plea that they put forth. And then Allah says, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Let them die, because once they die, behind them is an obstacle, a wall, a law, a world, until the day they are resurrected. It is widely preached these days that after we die, we go to the world of Barzakh, and they, even they call it in our books, Al-Hayat al barzakhiyah the life of the Barzakh. This appellation is absolutely wrong. Nowhere in the Quran where Allah says there is such a life. All that is, is that Allah tells us that when we die, our souls are kept somewhere safe, asleep, and nothing else. The world where the souls are kept is absolutely timeless. It, it, it doesn't bind and it doesn't bound to the laws of this world. We are there and there is a wall that we cannot go. That's why we cannot go to the world of the dead and they cannot come to us. Now, from the moment a warm body becomes stiff and a human being dies, it is common procedure for the believers to go through a very systematic 90% or 99% of that procedure is taken from the Hadith school of thoughts, scholars, sheikh, and so on and so forth. From the moment a warm body becomes a stiff, it is common procedure in the world of the believers today that we go through a very systematic procedure. 99% of this procedure, however, is taken from the hadith and school of thoughts, sheikhs and customs and what have you, right? If you ever had to deal with a funeral services bureau, they have a very defined set of steps they take. I will now share with you my experience and at the same time point out the challenges I faced as a parent who has just lost a son and how I dealt with them. I will start first with the community involvement. From the moment people heard about the death of my son, the whole family started receiving visits and phone calls and that was heartwarming. What I found out though is that the majority of people are very robotic about their condolences. What I mean by that? There is only two or three words for condolences, but the people that say them are different. The message is the same, the words are the same, and the feel is the same. Here are the words I heard most. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. The majority will tell it to you without them realizing what they actually are saying. And more importantly, why they say it. Some of them wing it fast. They say it fast, real fast. No emotions attached to it, even though when Allah mentioned this in Al-Quran, He didn't mean it as a form of condolences that we should, or a formula that we should exchange with each other. But rather a message to the concerned party at the time where a calamity 
hates any kind of halal calamity. It's not only death. Any kind of calamity, problems, tribulations that happens to the human, they should remind themselves, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. It's a message you send to yourself so that you stay calm. You stay on top of the problem. It is a message that Allah tells you, say it to yourself. It will help you ground yourself. Okay, it was not meant for to be said to people as a, a formula for condolences or whatever. The moral of this is: next time when you want to pay your condolences to someone, avoid telling them these generic words: "Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun," that we belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. Tell them words of comfort coming out from your own heart. Use your own words. Express yourself in your style. Don't be like the next one who is going to pay their condolences who are going to sound just like you. Don't blend in. Be yourself and transmit what's in your heart, not what the books tells you. This is extremely important. To me, when people came and paid their condolences to them, the first one I heard Then the other hundreds after that was just a repetition of the same message. It became at the end of it boring. I really got bored with people coming and telling me the same thing when I know deep inside them there is no real sympathy, there is no real compassion. It's just a duty they are doing. Which brings me to speak about the next point, the funeral services. When we went to the office, I wanted to wash my son with my own hands, the hands that held him when he came to life. From his mother's womb to my hands, how I paced by the hospital's door, awaiting the answer. Everything came right in front of my eyes. So when we got to this place here, we found already the sheikh had started doing that. Washing my son, even though we told them, don't touch the kid until we come. But hey, again, that is a bad communication between people. So when I got there and I found the man had started washing my son, deep inside me, I wanted to explode. But that was not the time nor the situation. And I kept telling to myself, I belong to Allah. And to him I shall return. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So I started washing with the sheikh, the, my son, and there was also my other son. I have uh, an elder son, 28, uh, 29, I think, uh, and my son, 26. So we started washing, and the sheikh started bossing us around. And he started telling me the sunnah is to, rise, uh, to wash the right first, and to do this first, and to do that first. I told him, Ya sheikh, if what you're telling me was that important, why didn't Allah say it in the Quran? Why? If I, if I wash the left side first, because I, at one point I had to stop him. So I told him, if I started washing the left side first, does that mean my son is going to hell fire? Does that make him an evil person? Does that mean that, that say he's ruined to death? He said, no, but it is sunnah. I said, says who? I said, the school of thoughts are in a complete war path. And at which point, he, uh, of course, I said, uh, I said it nicely, not in, now I get emotional when I see all these things. So, but he understood at one point that he shouldn't now intervene. But anyhow, so we carried on with the uh, wash. So the man later on started again, back when we put my son into the coffin and we had covered him and everything. Uh, uh, we are parents, brothers and sisters, we are crying and the, the, uh, my son is right in front of us. And I want to take this opportunity to share this with you. When we washed my son and then later on, his face was redder than red. It, it was impossible for anyone that looked at him to say he's dead. I, until we put him in the grave, I thought at one point he's going to wake up because he has been dead for six days. His body is still the same. And even though they did the autopsy and everything, the kid's face is incredibly uh, warm and nice. And it had that thing there. It's a kid that has never ever disobeyed Allah because since the age of two he became epileptic and the epilepsy took control of his whole mind for the entire part of his life he never spoke he was not responsible and for the entire life he was a absolutely beautiful 
kid in his own rights. Never done and never lied because he never spoke. He was never mischievous. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So, and, and that will bring me later on to talk about another point about him interceding for us and waiting for me at the gates of paradise. I will get back to that. And that was also a recurrent thing that people kept telling me. So, but anyhow, so I didn't want to argue much with the sheikh and I just uh, nicely pointed some things to him, enough to make him understand that I had good knowledge and I don't want to get into argument, uh, in an argument with him. Again, later on, the family, uh, he came to us when we were surrounding my son and crying, things like that. He came and he goes, Okay, what you need to do now is make dua for him. What he needs now is make dua for him. That really angered me to no end. As if we didn't know that uh, dua and things like that, right? But uh, I, again, I kept quiet. And then he said to the mother, he goes, especially you, his mother, your dua is far more important. And that blew my fuse. I said, subhanallah, ya shaykh. I said, fear Allah. I said, Allah says in the Quran, and we have trusted the human being to take care of both of his parents. The Quran throughout talks about how both parents are equal, and you come to me, says the mother. Oh, he goes, the hadith says, your mother, your mother, and your mother. I said, that is the hadith, and that is not true. I said, that hadith goes against the Quran. Fear Allah, ya Sheikh. And then that uh, statement calmed him down. Of course, the family ignored his advice, and he took the hint. Then we covered my son in his that white clothes, and we had to close the coffin, and uh, again, the sheikh was trying to help us make dua for him, and at one point I told him, really, I've had enough of you telling me to make dua for him, as if I was there. You see, my it's, the idea is, it's just like my son was lying down there, and I was, um, what was I doing? Uh, watching a movie. Like, my son is behind me, and I'm watching a movie, and I'm watching this uh, sitcom, and I'm having a good laugh. And then the man comes to me and he goes, why are you doing that? Do that for yourself. We around the coffin, my child's coffin, our tears, are, our hearts are going to fall into the coffin. And the man is still, do this, do this, do this, do that. Of course, he was not doing it in purpose, but that is his education. And that's how he is. And again, that is a sheikh. We traveled from the funeral services to the masjid. When we got to the masjid, it was Dhuhr prayers, which was around 12.30. I asked around if I could uh, uh, find the imam and speak to him uh, because I wanted to leave the janazah. The imam was not there. He would come five minutes before whatever. Uh, a friend of mine went there and asked the imam. And alhamdulillah, the imam said, no problem. The salat on my son was extremely difficult. And I have prayed, Allah knows how many janazah prayers on people. And I have made dua for him or whatever. But on my son, it was the hardest. It was from the day I held this boy when he came to this life in my hands. And here I am today, trusting him back to earth. It's a difficult experience. I'm really sorry, but it's a difficult experience. And I pray to Allah to never ever, I know this is kind of like incredible, impossible dua, but I pray to Allah, not to you, the listener especially, that you never ever have to bury your child. It's a horrible terrible, sinister. I can sit here and name 1,000 things as to why it's a horrible thing to do. But that is what happened there. So when I came and stood right in front of my child and he was lying down there and I started, I said the first Allahu Akbar. I had to make sure that my voice would stay the same, unchanged, and that I should not cry because I know if I get going, it's going to trigger a chain reaction. And uh, alhamdulillah, the, the salat went, and by the time the end, the last Allahu Akbar was extremely difficult because that was for me the last thing. I'm going to say about my child. Hey. People after that came and to say their condolences and they were uh, saying, again, they were so robotic about it. Four things kept coming back every time somebody spoke to me about my child. The very first one, this is the Qadr of Allah. They will tell you this is what Allah has written. And I wanted to tell them, stop accusing Allah. Stop it. 
But that was not the time for arguments or explanations, so I just shut my mouth up and took the punches and kept quiet. Point number two, everybody comes to me and says, patient, be patient, be patient, until I lost meaning of what be patient means. What am I doing that gives you the idea that I'm not patient? Which in fact is not true. The third point that they kept mentioning to me is he will be waiting for you at the gates of heaven. From the sheikh to the one who buried my child. Everybody in between kept telling he will be waiting for you at the gates of heaven. And the fourth one is he will intercede for you. Of course, All of these, of what they tell, uh, told me, is not true. I had to bite my lips because each and every one of these points is untrue. It's wrong. And I will tell you why. I will say about Allah's qadr that would make Allah a murderer, an assassin, and this is why it is not. My son died because he had fulfilled all the conditions that lead to death. And because of that, he died. Allah's laws of death applied to him. Allah is innocent. If someone took every care of themselves, ate very, very healthily, was extremely careful and managed to live for decades, maybe for over a hundred years, but Allah's laws of death do not apply to him because they are healthy, they are everything, right? However, Allah put other laws on earth that will eventually catch up with that healthy person and they will die. If not because of a disease or some sort of accident that the body degeneration will, the laws of degenerations will apply to him. Death is a cup. We all will sip from and that cup has a taste and we all shall taste from that cup. So, I wish, I wish I could tell them stop, but hey, point number two about being patient, an expression that is just thrown in your face, even if I was standing there, not doing anything, someone will just come to me and will tell me, be patient, as if I was tearing my clothes off, or that I was going around yelling at people, or that I had like an iron bar in my hands and going at cars and people, the problem is, the believers, the moment they see you cry, when they saw me, the moment they see a tear in my eyes, what they do, they come running to me and be patient, in other words, stop crying and be a man, If, I wish they just told me stop crying. That is more potent, more strong than be patient. As for he who will be waiting for me at the gates of heaven, and this is again uh, what people kept telling me, this really makes me wonder, do people really ever read the Quran? Do they understand what they read? I, 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 I don't know. Sometimes Allah talks gibberish and it's there, it's written and people read it, but they don't understand a word of it. Nobody, nobody will ever wait for anybody on judgment day. We are for ourselves. We are all alone and write that all alone capitals and write it with blood and gold. On judgment day, you will not have anybody, not a messenger, not an angel, nobody come to your help. Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصور, Then when a sur, which in the English translations, they translate it to the trumpet, when the trumpet is blown, there is no such a thing as the trumpet will blow. What Allah says about a sur, a sur is the wall surrounding a garden that determines that whatever is within these four walls belongs to somebody. When Allah created this universe, he created law that hold this universe together. They call it gravity, called what everyone call it, right? On judgment day, when Allah wants to terminate this world, Allah will terminate the laws first. Once the world has no wars, has no rules, has nothing that holds it together, that world will explode, will get destroyed. That's exactly what Allah means. It's got nothing to do with the trumpets. And all the hadith that The angel has got the trumpet in his eyes and he's looking at Allah, just waiting a uh, sign from Allah. Those are blasphemous email, uh, emails. <laughs> the hadith, it's, it's impossible. But anyhow, Allah says, فَإِذَا نُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ 
So when the end of the world comes in and Allah has given the order, Allah says, فَلَا أَنْسَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَلَا يَتَسَأَلُونَ There will be, I want you to pay attention to this, there will be no kinship among them that day, nor will they ask for one another. This should have been clear. But what did our man of religion and the man of hadith and the scholars and his eminence and that and this and jurisprudence, scholars, the school of thought, what did they do? They completely ignored what Allah says and built a cartoon-like religion where everything preached is just anti-Qur'an, against the Qur'an. Allah makes it clear that on judgment day la and sab, there is no kinship among human on the judgment day and we will not ask about any other person. It is making Allah do things that he said he won't do. Allah says there is nobody that's gonna do anything for somebody else or wait for them but we in the hadith we make Allah is going to do it. Allah says in the Quran, I'm not going to do it, but the hadith says he will do it. That's the problem. That's why we have a cartoon-like Islam that we followed today. On judgment day, no relationship. Only what you have done. This is why Allah warns us against judgment day. The idea that we should rely on the Prophet Muhammad to help us save us is absolutely nonsense. Look at what Allah says. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ So who he, whose scales weight heavy, they are heavy in weight, then those are the ones that are prosperous, the good deeds. But as for those whose scales of good deeds are light, they are those who will lose their own selves in hell for eternity. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فِي جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ This is an extremely important, I honestly say, I doubt that our righteous predecessors ever knew what is in the Quran or that they, I think there were people who faked a lot of things or our predecessors were really, really good people and those who wrote things after them changed what our predecessors wrote and the ignorant put whatever we put, they put and here we are today with a completely, as I said, cartoon-like religion. Allah says, and in case what I said is not enough, that there is no relationship and we're not going to ask about each other, Allah says another thing. Ya ayyuhan nas, mankind, Allah talks to all mankind. اتقوا ربكم واخشوا يوما Watch out from your Lord. Watch out what you're doing. And, and then he says, and watch out and fear a day, which is judgment day. What's going to happen on that day, Allah? Allah says, لا يجزي والد عن ولده ولا مولود هو جاز عن والده شيئا On that day, no parent will be of any benefit to their child and no child will be of any benefit to their parent. Then Allah tells us and assures us and makes really point clearer. He says, Inna wa'dallahi haq. Undoubtedly, Allah's promise is tangibly true. I.e., there is no relationship on judgment day. I will do, I cannot do anything for my son. My son will never ever do anything for me on judgment day. I am all alone. My child is all alone. And then Allah says, فَلَا تَخُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا So do not let this life of this world deceive you. وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Nor let the deceiver, they always say it's a shaitan who will deceive you about Allah. But actually the deceiver is anyone who deceives you away from Allah and his book. Which in this case here, my son will intercede for me, my son will wait for me at the gates of heaven, and all that nonsense. If a mother gives birth to a baby and the baby dies, or the mother dies, or the baby will be waiting for you on judgment day. That's it, we became gods. We became Allah. Is that enough? Or maybe I will, you need me to add some more? I will add something, a third one. Allah says in the Quran, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ On that day, judgment day, Every person will flee from their own siblings. And from his mother and from his father. And from his partner and from his children. Why Allah all this happens on judgment day? Well, 
because on, on that day لكل مريء منهم شأن يغنيه on that day every single human being will have enough on their plate to make him careless of others this is more than enough but our scholars ignore this and they make the messenger is going to intercede for us my umma my umma and Allah says don't worry we're going to help you and then my child is going to wait for me at the gates of heaven and he's going to intercede for me the martyr as they call it will die and will intercede for 70 people if you teach your child the Quran the child will intercede for you all this is nonsense all of it is absolutely nonsense Allah says there is no relationship on judgment day so will you recognize your child of course you will because Allah says you will run away from your mother you know it's your mother but you will run away from her no relationship you know it's your mother but there is no relationship between you and her no emotions not think Okay, so please keep the... And it's sad, but uh, that's what I had to put through uh, throughout. Uh, there was the pain of the loss of my child, and there was the pain of these people telling me all these things, and I wish people would read the Quran and understand what Allah says. Anyhow, at the cemetery, when we arrived to my son's new home, I saw faces of family and friends that I haven't seen for years. Strange how death brings people that have stopped being your friends and being your family. And I found out that many of them came not to because they felt sorry for my loss or for the loss of my child, but a great number of people came for one of the two reasons, or the two reasons together. One is making a good deed on your back. As I found out, many people don't know how to really feel. And this is true. The believers, we don't know how to feel uh, sorry. So what they say, or oh, there is a janaza, the hadith says, do this, you get that reward. So I, this is an opportunity for me to score. And they go there, and of course they will come and say, sorry, you lost your death. And they will tell you, be patient, your son is going to wait for you at the gates, and the son is going to intercede for you. Same thing. So the people will just produce generic texts And what, why they are there for? To get rewards. And I learned that people don't do things out of their good heart. They do them because they see you as a reward generating machine. What you are going through is a reward generating machine. The other reason is they are worried about what people will say about them. Because if a friend goes to the funeral of my child and the other one doesn't come, so it's kind of like the gossip later on. I will explain this a little bit later. So, do you or do I cure the diseased? So this is a question that the sheikh asked me, the talqin in Arabic. Uh, and the, the reason what's this talqin is, at the time when they put the dead person and they cover the, the, uh, the body with the earth and everything, the sheikh will stand on the grave and he will say, oh, uh, now you are, you, you're gonna, now he's talking to the dead person. And people are hearing, okay? And he will say, usually the text is about 20 lines of, of nonsense, right? And that Ibrahim did this and Ismail did that they bring all these things but the the modern version is that they will tell you now that you are in your grave and you are sleeping ya abdullah uh, the i.e. subservient of allah two angels are going to come to you and they're going to make you sit and they're going to ask you about who is this man and you need to tell them that it is muhammad the messenger of allah you believed in him and you followed this sunnah and then they will ask you about uh, who your lord is and you gotta say it is allah then they ask you about what religion uh, you, you follow then you say it's uh, Al-Islam there are three questions and there is another hadith again that adds a fourth element is how did you know all this and then you're going to say oh I read the book of Allah for the sunnah blah 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 and he told me do you want to say this to your child or I say it to your child and I nearly lost my mind Wallahi, I nearly lost my mind and I was going to and I told him the, we, we were on our on the hearse to the cemetery so the driver was with us I had my daughter with us I told him a sheikh and again because he's the sheikh and I didn't want to embarrass him and I said yeah sheikh we don't do the talqin we don't do the cue into my child we don't want to do all that oh I guess I always do it and then he says it's a sunnah I said no it's not a sunnah I said the scholars even say it's a fabricated thing I was trying and yes there are scholars who say that but I was just doing my best to get him away from it however now I'm going to tell you why all these thoughts come and how what we are doing goes against the teachings of Al-Quran in a hadith by Al-Bukhari 
and Muslim and an Nasai. For your information, in the man-made religion, in the cartoon-like Islam that we follow today, any hadith that is made up of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, that hadith is mentioned in these two books, is as equal, if not higher, than the Quran. Sad, but it's true. They say that Anas ibn Malik, Anas ibn Malik is a young man who served the messenger for 10 years, starting from the age he was 10 to 20. And I will speak more about this when I speak about the hadith, but for now. Anas tells us of the incident of the Battle of Badr. The Muslims had won the battle three days ago, and uh, they said that the messenger stayed there to show Quraysh that he was not scared of them. So three days later, the messenger goes to the graves of the disbelievers because now they have put the, the, the people inside the earth and end of it. So there was Abu Jahl, Umayyah, Utbah, Shayba, great people that were against the messenger, and they were all buried together because they're not going to bury four graves, you know, the time that is difficult and all. So they say that the messenger went after three days and stood on that grave and started calling, Ya Aba Jal, Ibn Hisham, Ya Umayy Ibn Khalaf, Ya Utba, Ya Shayba, start calling the people. And then he tells them, Have you not found what your Lord had promised you to be correct? As for me, I have found the promises of my Lord to be true. Omar saw that of other companions and they were surprised. Omar tells the messenger, messenger of Allah, how can they listen and respond to you? They are dead and their bodies have decayed by now, they, they have decomposed. Thereupon the messenger says, by him in whose hand is my life. What I am saying to them is well heard by them. Even you cannot hear more distinctly than they, but they lack the power to reply. Which means that the dead people could very well understand the messenger, but they cannot just respond to him. Again, as I said, because this hadith is in Al-Bukhari, Muslim and Al-Nasai, this is a more, uh, how do I put it? It's a more authoritative, it's more big hadith, it's, it's done the Quran, i.e. people would believe in this, in this hadith undoubtedly, nothing, nothing, nothing. Now let's see what Allah the God of Al-Bukhari and the God of Muslim and the God of An-Nasai and the rest of the organized religion that we have today with the government sheikhs and all these men that are keeping this cartoon-like religion, let's say, let's see what Allah says about the whole issue, right? Well, here is what Allah says about a human being, the messenger talking to a dead and the dead people hearing and all that kind of stuff. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا يَسْتَوِي الْأَحْيَاءُ وَلَا الْأَمْوَاتِ The living and the dead cannot be equals. Either in real life, you and me are alive and the other one is dead, you're not equal. And the same thing, those who follow the Quran are they alive and those who don't follow the Quran are not alive. Then Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسْمِعُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah makes to hear whomever he wills. So, not, not that Allah wills and you, no, no, no. So whoever wants Allah to make him hear, they should do the work and the job so that Allah helps them. That's what it is. So if you are looking for guidance, go look for it. Allah will help you. And then Allah says to Muhammad, to the messenger of Allah, he tells him, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِمُسْمِعٍ مَنْ فِي الْقُبُورِ And you, Muhammad, cannot make those people who are in the graves hear you. And this is in Fatr 35. What Allah is telling, literally what Allah is saying to Muhammad, you are not capable or ever be able to make the dead people that are buried or not buried hear what you are saying. Allah says it is impossible for the messenger to make dead people hear him. But Mr. Al-Bukhari, Mr. Muslim, and Al-Nasai, and an incredible number and tons of the men of religion insist on proving Allah wrong. Allah says you cannot, but Al-Bukhari and Muslim and the men of religion, men of hadith, all that kind of stuff, says nope, you can. The Quran is wrong. Who cares about the Quran? If Allah is shown as someone who doesn't know what he is doing, in the Quran he says something, and in the hadith says something else, who cares? If the Quran goes to hell, who cares? 
This, this is incredible, the amount of ignorance that has traveled for 1,400 years. And then we find it difficult that the Christians cannot see that Jesus is not Son of God. These people have been going at this belief for 2,000 years. If we accept that the Hadith competes with the Quran, overshadows the Quran, that the Quran is abandoned and we're happy with it, why should we blame the rest of the world for what they're doing? But that is the problem we are facing these days. And okay, that is the case, right? But then again, we have the Hadith mechanics. The Hadith mechanics, when they find an ayah like this, which is blatantly open, that you cannot talk to dead people, but we have the Hadith that says that the messenger did. Now you've got the mechanics. What can we do to keep the Quran as it is? You cannot talk to the dead, but... Since the hadith says that Muhammad spoke to the dead, we need to find some form of an explanation that goes with that. And you're not going to believe the amount of lies, the amount of deceit that they brought, all of it. Muhammad spoke to the dead and they heard him. It, it cannot be wrong. On Judgment Day, these people will have a very difficult time, those so-called scholars. Back to the talqeen or the queuing of the dead, okay? In the books of the Hadith, they tell us that the messenger is supposed to have said to Anas ibn Malik, again, it's Mr. Anas ibn Malik, uh, I'm sure that Anas ibn Malik hasn't said 99% of what they say he said. It is those fabricators and those men of religion and our scholars who put lies and then put everything on the messenger's tab. Th that's it. Uh, they say that the messenger said when a human being is put in his grave and his companions return and he even hears their footsteps, two angels shall come to him and they will make him see it and they will ask him about, as I said, Muhammad and the Islam and Allah and all that kind of stuff. Qatada is one of the narrators of the hadith. And then he said, the hadith stops at Allah has given you a place in paradise instead of it, so he will see both places. What the hadith says is this, when you die, you will see paradise and that's how you get the good news. So if that is the case, what the heck is the judgment day for? Why? Why is the humans, this person that is in the graveyard has been told that he is going to hellfire or paradise, right? Now, I'm going to just take my example, okay? I'm dead and the angels came to me and says, you know what, you're going to hellfire, okay? I'm scared and everything. On judgment day, why does Allah need again to hold me accountable? What's the purpose? I already know I'm going to hellfire. What's the purpose? Wallahi al they make judgment day superfluous. And then Qatada said, we were informed that his grave would be made spacious. And that's why we say, Allah was sali, Allah makes it spacious for you. This is Qatada, another messenger. And again, this is a lie. Wallahi al it is a lie, even if it is in Al-Bukhari, Muslim and every other book. Needless to say that this man made hadiths go against the Quran. And each and every letter of a hadith goes against each and every letter of the Quran. These man made hadiths and the likes are pure evil darkness and they are fighting the pure goodness of the light that is Al-Quran. If Allah has called the Quran a light, it means anything else other than the Quran that will serve you on judgment today is darkness. The Sheikh's intention is good. His intention was that he would do for my son and do for good. And I don't blame him for that goodness only if he read the Quran and study the Quran and, and things would be absolutely fantastic. I will come now to the community support and as I said even though people called and sent messages and even though some texts and uh, most of the texts were copy paste from the internet from here and it was more hurtful because I know people are not being honest I know people are saying it just because they gotta say it because it's a situation right but what can we say we really really need to work on our emotions we need to work well with our emotions. I love it that the Christians, when they bury somebody, always his friends, the family, stand there and say something good about the person. They remember the person with the good that they had in memory. They always bring the good of that person. If it is picture, they will always post the most beautiful picture that you know about that person. Look at the singers when they die, celebrities. They never give you the picture of their death. They always give you the picture of where you can remember them by the good that they were, even if they went wrong at one point. 
In the community support, I experienced two experiences that I that, that will stay with me as long as I live. One of which is a sister, Zahalakher, that called and expressed her emotions. She was crying. She was absolutely devastated by the, uh, the thing. And she didn't tell me, Inna lillahi She was, Ya Ustad, I, I feel your pain and I pray to Allah. And she was, she really was there with her emotion about my child and that I will treasure for as long as I live. And then she said, Ustad, if you need anything from me, my family, please do say. And I told her, I really thank you for that. I, I don't need anything. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, because you're not going to put a list, I need this, I need that. And at that moment, there was not. So it was not that I was lying, but I, it was just an answer. And then she said, Ustad, I want to uh, send you some money. I said, I really don't, you don't need to. She goes, no, no, no I insist. And uh, of course, I did everything to say, no, no, no. But she said, I insist. And then she sent some money. That is, it touched me to no end. We all know funerals uh, cost here in England. We pay about 3,000, 3,500 pounds. And imagine a family who doesn't have money. What's going to happen to them? Either the body is going to be cremated by the government or what? They're going to sell. They're going to do what? So my advice is the next time you hear someone has lost a child or somebody, send them money. Don't sell them in on some generic text. Send them money. Offer. If they say no, put a hundred dollars, sorry, a hundred pounds in an envelope and take it to them. Send it to them. Send them anything. Send them money. Please. And this is a vow I will make on myself from now on until I die. Whenever I hear somebody has lost a member of a family, I will send money. I will make it my purpose to send money. Because if nothing, is going to ease up the worry about burying their loss. That is one thing. The other thing is one young Englishman. When we took my child out of the funeral services and I was standing there waiting for the imam and I was standing on the street waiting for the car to come out, I was crying. And uh, there was a young man coming from there and I was crying into my own word. He stopped by me and he came to me and shook my hand, white young Englishman, and he goes, I am really sorry for your loss. He said it once. And he looked at me, but in his eyes, he had written a book of sympathy, compassion, empathy, and it, it really meant the world. I, it gave me that hope in humanity. We are not all jerks. We are not all losers. I have found in that Englishman what I have not found in a thousand believers of my old friends. Nothing. But he came. It's incredible how sometimes a nice word that comes from the heart, accompanied with an expression in the eyes, can do to your soul. It can make you feel comfortable, make you feel safe. And, and that is what that young man has done. Just that sister from one end and that young man from there. And it gave me a whole world of, of, of new things. I don't know what they are, but it made me, it made not to restore my faith in humanity, but I knew there were good people out there. My dear sisters and my brothers, death is a spiritual journey. For those who lost somebody, the pain is huge and big. Death fuels sadness and regret. And that's why when someone, you know, loses somebody, don't just do your duty and then forget about them. Ask about them after the burial. If you can attend the burial, attend the burial because you care not to mark your presence or to get rewards. Attend a burial because you care, because you are a human being and one day it's going to happen to you and you would wish for people to be at your funerals because they care not to score rewards on your behalf or just to mark they were present, not absent on your behalf. A month later, take on your family, check on them, call them, go visit them. Six months later, at the anniversary of the dead, be there. Keep note of when the family is going to, i.e., be a human being for the compassion that Allah has created in us. Death is not the end of it all. All that happens at death is 
the soul gets withdrawn from the container, the container put on earth here, and the soul travels to the next world, well, it remains asleep until judgment day. And when we are asleep, just like in this life, we have good dreams, bad dreams, you have no dreams. So the people that are going to paradise, they might have good dreams in their death and uh, as they sleep. And the bad people will have nightmares. And those who are so, so wishy-washy, they will get nothing. That is how Allah deals. Punishment of um, judgment day will start only after accountability. And accountability starts on judgment day. When somebody dies, is exactly like when you go to sleep. You put your head, the moment you close your eyes and you lose consciousness and you are asleep, when you open your eyes, it's judgment day. For the dead people, there is no time. That's why somebody, Adam, now he is dead, and the last man that is going to die, both of them, when they wake up, they don't know how long they have been asleep because they were not alive in the graves. Read the Quran. The Quran has everything that Allah wants us to know. This is my experience with the child that I have lost. And I, I pray to Allah to bless your children, give you the opportunity to establish better relationship with them. And always, always, always remember, the child you're looking at today, the child you are annoyed with today, the child that is getting on your nerves today, the child that you don't like, da, 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 da. If they die tomorrow, you're going to cry. And you are going to be sad. You're going to regret. And above all, you're going to be by yourself. So enjoy while your child is with you. This is again your brother Abdus Salam. And uh, all this is in memory of my son Muaz. And I pray to Allah that he joins me with him. And that I, in Jannah of course, after we have gone through the thick and thin of the day of uh, judgment. And I pray to Allah to gather us all under his compassion and mercy. Again, please join my group or join my YouTube channel. And Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I say thank you for all of you who have supported me and are still supporting me through this thick and thin of the time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.